I'm the Adult Programs Coordinator here at the Kellogg Hubbard Library. It's lovely to have you here for First Wednesdays. I feel like we're kind of a little community of friends tonight, so uh, thanks for being here. Uh, we extend our thanks to our partners at, at Vermont Humanities, as well as to the generous underwriters who make it possible for us to offer such rich and robust programming. The sponsor for our entire First Wednesday season is the v Vermont Department of Libraries and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. This program is funded in part by the Democracy and the Informed Citizen Initiative, administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils and funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. The initiative seeks to deepen the public's knowledge and appreciation of the vital connections between democracy, the humanities, journalism, and an informed citizenry. We hope you will check in for the event, and the QR code is at the table in the back. The Vermont Humanities uses this data for reporting on the success of this program to local, state, and national supporters. During the winter months, uh, Vermont Humanities First Wednesdays will move to the online format. So we hope you go to vermonthumanities.org and sign up for the really great uh, programs that will happen through the cold winter months when you won't have to drive anywhere to see a really good program. And I'm going to switch over to you, Christopher, so you can talk a little bit about your... Just very briefly, as you all came in, you took one of our Freedom and Unity comics, and I brought them here tonight because of the connection of democracy and journalism, uh, as well as DATIC, the Democracy and the Informed Citizen Project, which also helped to fund the comic book. Uh, this is actually the final event of Democracy and the Informed Citizen, which was meant to end two years ago, but something happened. <laughs> so uh, thank you uh, to the speakers for, for coming out tonight, um, quite a ways after the actual end of, of the, the data grant. Uh, the comic book is about uh, democracy in Vermont. Uh, there's a companion book called This Is What Democracy Looks Like that's also available from the Center for Cartoon Studies that's about the federal uh, government system. Uh, and encourage you to check that one out as well. If anybody wants multiple copies, if you're teaching or would like to bring them to a local uh, group that you're a part of, you can certainly get them from Vermont Humanities or the Vermont Secretary of State's office, which was also the co-commissioner in this process. So thank you very much, and um, thanks for hosting First Wednesdays. It's really great to be back in person. It is, it is. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Megan Little Riley is the Director of Communi Communications at Convergence Center for Policy Resolution and helped found the Center for Community News at UVM, where she is now the chair of the board. She's the author of the novels The Misfortunes of Family, Everything That Follows, and We Are Unprepared. Her fourth book, How to Be Alive, was a finalist for the Black Lawrence Press 2022 Big Moose Prize. And Tim, I forgot to ask, ask how you pronounce your last name. I say caliber. I don't care how people say okay. it. Anything's correct. All right. Really? Oh, good. <laughs> Tim Calibro is the editor and publisher of the White River Valley Herald, just the fifth in nearly a 150-year history of the Randolph newspaper. He graduated with a Spanish degree from the University of Vermont and started his career at the Herald as a high school photography intern, covering basketball games, events, and goings-on at South Royalton High School before being sucked into a life of community journalism. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Go for it. All right. Well, I don't know. What, we're kind of on a tour now. We sort of did this a few days ago too. But I'm going to let I'm going to let Tim talk about as the practitioner of journalism here. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll let me just open by saying um, so. I come at this from really the like democracy and local journalism intersection place. This is so exciting. By the way, Vermont Humanities is really like a leader in the field on this and it's exciting to work with them. Um, one of the things that, one of the way, I, I came to this after a career in Washington politics, I worked in the Obama administration as a communicator and um, I, and, and eventually kind of shifted over to a more nonpartisan advocacy for um, stronger, a stronger fourth state and, uh, and community journalism in particular where I worked um, with Richard Watts at the University of Vermont on um, the Community News Service, which is a really cool program that allows uh, student journalists to partner with local
sustain the whole ecosystem of Vermont news today, which is very exciting. Um, we started uh, this year the Center for Community News, which is helping other universities around the country um, build and initiate their own such programs. Um, it's just one little solution in a whole, um, it, in like a very, very big tidal wave that is coming for local news. And so we're probably going to need a whole bunch of creative ideas around the country to, um, to, to stem that tide. Um, and the reason it matters, and we know it matters so much, mostly because of the ways that we measure the harms done to local communities once um, local newsrooms leave. Um, there's just abundant research in recent years that uh, strong local journalism, it builds social cohesion, it enforces a sense of identity and culture, um, it's good for governance and government accountability, more transparency in local governance. Um, there's, I have, I'm not gonna bore you, but I do just to make sure I don't like make any numbers up off the top of my head. There are like a few really interesting, I think kind of arresting statistics on this. Um, that things like um, areas served by newspapers with sharp declines in newsroom staffing have significantly reduced political competition in all of their local races. Um, they, in places where um, lo local news is still there, um, municipal borrowing costs tend to be less, sometimes by like a pretty significant number actually, um, because of government monitoring is associated with higher government wages. Um, and uh, it's, it, 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 again, it's the, it's the enforcement of transparency and accountability by, um, it, it's basically like just better decision making at a local level. Um, local news consumption is associated with higher voter turnout, obviously, um, and a sense of community and identity, as I said already. Um, so there's, there are a lot of good reasons for this, um, to, for us to try to make it to understand local news not merely as a consumer product, but also a pillar of a functional democracy, which is kind of a shift in the way that we've thought about local news historically. Um, and I don't want to just romanticize the presence of it, because in a lot of places, what we have now are ghost newspapers, which is basically the thing where like a hedge fund or something buys up a bunch of newspapers and just sort of like keeps them alive as essentially, you know, grocery store flyers and like local sports headlines, but without any like really rigorous beat reporting. Um, and those are also no good. In some ways, they're sort of more insidious because they have a kind of facade of functionality. Um, but what I'm talking about is like true, reliable, um, rigorous news reporting that like matters to a community. So that's like my... Um, that, that's that's the the work that we're doing with the Center for Community News. It's also the, um, something I'm interested in my other job, my day job, which is with a national think tank called the um, Convergence Center for Policy Resolution, which is interested in um, decreasing toxic polarization and improving problem solving at the federal policy level, um, which isn't about making people agree, in fact, in a... Um, uh, diverse and pluralistic society, uh, uh, wildly divergent views is like one of the, the great benefits of it. It's just about maintaining a sense of humanity for the people that we have to like share this country with um, and not inciting violence against one another um, as an example. So, um, and, and that's a whole other thread of this argument, which is that local news is also, a, it attends to inoculate communities against that kind of toxic polarization because when there, there are a number of studies that have been done that demonstrate that when local newspapers die, I'm talking mostly about newspapers, but obviously a lot of these also live online and they can be just as strong and important. Um, but when local news coverage goes away, people's news consumption tends to shift. It doesn't usually go to the newspaper that's 50 miles down the road. It goes to national news organizations, which have a more kind of self-selecting sort of polarized viewpoint of most things. And they also tend to have more like political horse race reporting. Um, I mean, you will know all this instinctively. Um, so that's why it matters. But I would love to hear Tim talk a little bit about how you like do this with the students that you work with, the young people who you work with, and what the future feels like. Yeah. So. This is kind of interesting because my perspective on this is not at all academic in any way whatsoever. It's mostly 
how are we going to get, I run a weekly newspaper in Randolph, and it's mostly how are we going to get next week's paper out starting from nothing at the beginning of every week. And in fact, this is the beginning of our week because we finished uh, tomorrow's paper uh, this afternoon. So that's a minor miracle that happens at the Herald every single week. It just still amazes me to this day, and I've been at this paper for like 20-something years now, which is awesome. Um, we've had the great fortune to work with the Community News Service, um, I don't know, like three years? Does that sound familiar? Three yeah, years? Yeah, I think it was about three years ago in we our pre-pandemic yeah. tour, yeah. We've had like seven or eight um, interns, and they are uniformly awesome people who are enthusiastic about, um, about getting involved in local news, which is amazing to me because some of, you know, some people are, you know, Vermonters who grow up in small towns and are really into it because their families are into, are into being involved in their communities. And other people, um, one, of our, one of our first students moved here from New Jersey and um, she heard about the, the community news service and she was like, that sounds just like an incredible thing to do and got in touch with us and um, she was a great reporter um, without any of that background. It was absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, so just a little bit about the Herald because that's my frame of reference for everything is um, we cover 16 towns uh, kind of centered around Randolph in um, uh, the southern part of Orange County, the northern part of Windsor County. Um, it's a very small population. It's one of the, Orange County is one of the more rural places in the state. Um, Northeast Kingdom has its beat in some regards, but uh, there are not many people in our area. There are not a lot of businesses in our area, and we're a very old, old-fashioned newspaper that um, still functions entirely um, on the graces of uh, advertising dollars, which is a, a financial pressure that um, we, I don't know that anyone in the industry has pinpointed a solution to, uh, to those types of things, but that's a place that uh, has sort of steadily been, those dollars have steadily been falling since about 2008 when the recession hit then. Um, that might be a good, I don't know. Is that a good like jumping off point to talk about something? Yeah, we're, it's, we're also hoping that there will be a lot of questions yeah, from we, you guys because it's much more interesting to react to whatever you guys are thinking than what's totally. the most growing. On. The only the only thing I'll respond to quickly is that 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 thing of introducing students from other parts of the country to reporting in Vermont is really special because um, like. It is done differently here. Town meeting day is, every student that I've ever worked with who had something to do with town meeting day and reporting was really, really delighted by the direct experience of democracy, which um, no one else comes with. I mean, we're the only state that's doing it. And um, more than that, I think there's like an ethos of participation that's really new to a lot of them as well. Um, and I, I asked a group of students earlier this year if they remembered going, where they remembered going with their parents to vote, if they voted for anything, a small or large election. And about half the people in the room, these were students who were all pretty engaged with the world, so they kind of remember going to like a, a, a school um, auditorium or something like that. Um, and I, I suspect that when you ask Vermonters, more people who grew up here have a memory of like watching democracy happen, which is a, is a really informative experience. Um, so that's kind of a neat reminder of, uh, and it's not, um, it's easy to take it for granted, and uh, it's not, you know, it, it, it requires a maintenance and sort of a, a kind of like active protection, I think, because all of the other forces in our society are, uh, are, are, are working against maintaining, I think, tapping, including uh, technology and global health crises. It's a little um, bit like eating broccoli, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. You get, you, it's really good for you if you do it. Um, and broccoli is really good, but candy's a lot better. And those are kind of the, the tensions, I think, in news as well. It's like there's a lot of things that are really good for you to know about that are going on, you know, in your name, um, 
but those aren't necessarily the most interesting things to most people, which is also a it's, a little, it's a little tedious. Yeah, to, a little as tedious. we can say, yeah. Yeah, no. There's a reason that select board meetings are pretty sparsely attended in most places. Indeed. I'd love to just should we just take questions if people want to talk. I'd yeah. Love to hear what other people have to say about this. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'd love to, to just say that New Hampshire also has a very unique state house. We have a really accessible state house here. New Hampshire does too. There's 435 reps over there. Mm -hmm. It's like a representative for each 3,000 people over there. And I came to Vermont a decade ago because my partner was working for the Digger and wanted to work in the state house. She was covering the New Hampshire state house. And um, at that point, state house coverage was down. 300% uh, nationwide. And so many things were going on in state houses that test laws, test lobbying, create public policy. And um, what I'd love to, if anybody's interested in talking about, is to hear about how we might make sure that state houses are getting covered. Because good policy spreads and bad policy spreads. If bad policy gets made, some people are like, ooh that empowers me in an interesting way. I want to do that in my state. Good policy for the commonwealth and for the common health also gets made. And that becomes um, public policy. And, and reporting out to the citizenry about how it's going to affect them, I think, is a really important thing. So It's the, the disappearance of the state house beat at, in local newsrooms. First of all, it's like, probably the number one concern for places like the Center for Community News. I think it's the most costly of all of the um, the local beat disappearances. With that too, I would say courthouses, you know, mm -hmm. um, just having having the, the people, and, and there are cool things as an aside, I should say that there are places doing interesting things with citizen journalism. So they're like training citizens who don't identify as journalists, didn't go to Jay's school, but might be able to operate as just like court watchers and help sort of feed raw information to newsrooms. And these are like creative ideas that are finding little uh, sparks of interest around the country. And I think that they, there's a lot of promise in places like that. But state house coverage requires um, a more sophisticated level of knowledge about how, of state specific laws, and also like uh, relationship development and cultivation among the people who work inside a state house too, I think is helpful. So in context, um, the beat, the disappearance of beats, it's, it's actually, I, I heard a, um, an African journalist speaking about this about six months ago, and it was like you could, she could have been talking about any rural region in the United States, the way she was talking about what's happening in other parts of Europe, Africa, um, with, and it's this, because it's the same economic pressures everywhere. Digital um, media is displacing some of this, and, um, and I think <clears throat> it went faster than people recognized what the social cost would be in a lot of places. And that's not necessarily a bad thing either, like just jumping on the digital media thing. I mean, Vermont Digger has been an amazing thing for state house reporting in, in Vermont. Um, uh, I used to work um, weekends at the Times Argus and the Rutland Herald as a photographer, and I, there was a very vibrant um, uh, Vermont Press Bureau at one point that would cover the state house, you know, pretty comprehensively. And that was just, you know, if, if uh, it, would, it was Pete Hirschfeld who's on Vermont Public now. Um, I hate saying Vermont Public still. Um, uh, and he was just one of several reporters who would be at everything covering every step of the way. Um, and that's you know, one of the things, that was one of the costs, you know, the, of the recession, I think, is that financial pressures really pushed um, reporters out of state houses. Um, I think it's interesting to uh, bring up the courts in a similar way because the courts in a lot of ways are um, much more opaque than other parts of government. And there's some great dysfunction at, at uh, state courthouses all over the place that is really difficult to access unless you have a person actually sitting there all the time 
we're in a weird state of limbo right now um, from the pandemic. Things were, you know, put on pause or uh, closed down entirely. There was a push to go to um, remote hearings. Now we're seeing some judges in some places saying, no, we're not going to allow people to, um, to use these remote technologies anymore. So that means, I was talking with Mike Donahue, who's the, um, used to work at the Burlington Free Press, and he's um, been the Vermont Press Association director for ever and ever and ever. Um, he covers the courts pretty heavily, even though he is retired. And he was trying to cover this particular case. He had the, you know, the link to call in instead of driving from Burlington to Brattleboro for the half hour hearing. And at the last second, the judge says, no, we're not going to be able to use that anymore. Um, you're going to have to come down here and, and actually sit there and listen to it. So weird things like that, the, the minutia of it make a big difference, I guess is what I'm getting at. Court watcher backlash yeah. has, yeah. has popped up in a variety of places where people were really uncovering weird things going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By tele, by tele court watching, yeah. and all of a sudden they're like, "Oh, we don't want you to know about that, so we're taking away your tele access." Yeah, and and we used to have a person, just not a reporter. The Her the Herald's an interesting group in that. I'm trying to think if we've ever had anyone who went to journalism school work at the Herald. I don't think so. We have a reporter now who may have, but I'm not. I can't quite remember if that's true or not. Um, but we had just a person who lived in the community in Chelsea who would go to the courthouse and just do the simple work of getting a log of all of the arraignments and all of the sentencings. So we could have a, we could, um, we could publish that or we could keep an eye on what was happening so we could be like, oh, this is an important thing that's going to be coming up when it comes to trial later on. And just getting those records in bulk all at once has become a, too big a hassle for her to do any longer. So we've we lose that now. So unless we know that there is a specific case that we um, want to look at, then that's a, that's a piece of reporting that we miss. And it's in the like aggregate where you really recognize trends and in, like inequities yeah. among disparate groups too. Um, so it is a huge loss. You know, it's um, it's kind of a bummer to talk about the economics of it all, but it is also the engine driving a lot of these changes. It's pretty widely understood that the start of some of um, the demise of, new, of print newspapers was uh, things like Craigslist, right? When you could start posting small things that you, you previously would have paid $50 to advertise in the back of a newspaper. Um, and, uh, and it's like easy to sort of just vilify the technology, but it has also democratized a lot of things and given us beautiful things like BT Digger that are doing that's yeah. doing great reporting. Um, so it's really not and like that that churn of technology isn't going to stop at any point. Um, but the, so the question is like, how do you shore up newsrooms to keep to stay nimble even as the ways we consume news shift over time? And um, we we hosted. Um, the Center for Community News hosted a conversation among like, foundations, the uh, d different journalistic enterprises, um, Port for America, places that are trying to think of new ways to do it. And um, I, it, it, it seems as though the answer isn't one answer. It is probably that we will never again rely exclusively on advertising, um, which may not be a bad thing, especially if we're especially if people are invested in the idea of understanding good reporting as being a, like a pillar of democracy, um, then there may be a way to think about it. it you know, there, uh, there are sort of other avenues and levers to push things like, there's, there are two pieces of legislation that aren't getting, getting any traction in Washington, but they are ideas to consider. And, it's, and some states are interested in, in entertaining these as well, which is like giving taxpayers opportunities to divert some of their taxes towards like a local newspaper if they're interested. Um, there are things like the more BBC model, which we have a teeny tiny bit of with the, um, uh, with the public radio model, but it's too small to really even sort of count it among that. That leaves you vulnerable to shifting political winds, yep. of course. So there's like, there are pluses and minuses to all these things, um, memberships and paywalls. Um, and I 
it, it seems as though the answer will be in diversifying how newsrooms sustain themselves, but they're, they weren't all built for this. And uh, a lot of small newspapers are just one person. And that person doesn't usually go into it because they have a marketing degree, right? So um, it's a hard, so in Vermont, we're trying to find ways to maybe um, pool resources and share best practices and get people talking to each other so that nobody feels like they're like on an island trying to keep their newspaper afloat or like hoping that a benevolent millionaire comes along, um, which comes with its own problems. But um, I'm curious if people have like opinions about the ethics and the promise of those different models for keeping these groups alive. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's right in line of what you're looking for, but my question is somewhat economics and the profession itself. So I'm not in the industry. I'm an outsider. I'm someone who reads the paper, if you will. Thank you. And, um, but I'm curious with the changes from my perspective, how um, as a professional, you kept, I'll say, independent integrity if your parent, whether it be the hedge fund or the multimillionaire who buys the paper who has a bias, mm -hmm. um, but you want to be fair and honest you know, and, and do that. Uh, but knowing public opinion has this thought of, well, this paper leans this way or that way. Um, so as a professional, how do you deal with that? And as you get into the career um, when you're young and naive. And you're both so young, but <laughs> I'm sure not naive. But I'm just interested in the profession, because as I look at it from my eyes, I'm like, man, that's got to be pretty tough. Because you get beat up. My perception is yeah. journalists get beat up. It's, it's depending <coughs> where you are, you're either a good guy or you know not. I, I think that you have to come to grips with the fact pretty early on that on any given story, a bunch of people are really gonna like what you have to say and a bunch of people are really gonna hate what you have to say. And those people might switch their opinion about you for the next story. Sure. So it's, it's uh, I don't think there's like an easy answer. I mean, I don't like it when people don't like me, but you have job it happens right? enough that it's, uh, you know, it makes for some incredibly funny, angry letters that, that I get sure. sometimes. Yeah. Um, so that's that's nice, I guess. Um, have you seen have Have you seen a change, like an increase, in people telling you what they think of your coverage over the last couple of years? That's a good question. Maybe it's. It's, it's definitely not statistically significant. <laughs> I feel I, people are definitely more vociferous about how they feel about the coverage. I mean, I may, might make it the same number of people saying, you know, I didn't like this, I do like this, um, but they're much more emphatic about how they feel now. Um, well, much of history is written in the letters to the editors. And the letters and, to the editor are great. And I and th that's love it when people write letters that I disagree with wholeheartedly. It's a fascinating I, part of, of our historical record in newspapers. Yeah. What's been interesting in electronic papers is they have not wanted to or couldn't afford moderators. So many electronic places have shut their comment section down and were missing yeah. an opportunity for civil, civic discourse because it wasn't civil and it wasn't civic. So you need moderators to do that. And that investment seems really important to role model the interaction in journalism. And, and that's, a, that, that's an interesting thing that the tech, the tech community is also not immune to. I mean, moderation online is really hard. Um, there is a woman in Randolph who's a librarian, so she's wonderful, her name's Jessamyn West. West. And uh, she hero. is now the owner of this website called Metafilter, which was a very kind of early proto-social media um, platform in the early 2000s. And one of the things that Metafilter did very well was, um, was moderation. They, from the beginning, hired a bunch of moderators to make sure that the discourse was kept pretty civil. Um, it's also set up in such a way that it operates a little more slowly than say, the disaster that is Twitter. 
but um, they've had really big trouble making uh, any um, financial gains with, with that model. And they've kind of, I mean, Jessamine took it over because she loved it and had a long history with it. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not the big tech company that it probably could be. Um, people like yelling at each other online. Maybe you have a perspective on the independence as a journalist and any influence, whether it be from a parent company or special interest? I, <clears throat> I think I'm going to come at this from the sort of other side of this, which is okay. that I, I think that there's a really important role for media literacy in addressing all of this. You know, one of the things that's kind of encouraging, actually, in young, in student journalists, people coming up, I'm, I'm curious if you've observed this, too, is that um, when I, I started actually as a producer from on public radio in my early career, so I was on the journalism side of it. and. Um, I, I, I was still part of an understanding of news making as being a kind of like voice from nowhere, right? There's like one authoritarian voice, and this was the, like at a time like you could just, you know, there were a couple of network news shows at the end of the day, and right. they were all, they were kind of the authorities. And, um, and no one is, no one is approaching news making that way anymore, at least not in sort of academic sense. There's an understanding that like we all come in with our own biases and your job isn't to pretend to be like a sort of thoughtless robot. It's just to be consistently, to be conscious of your own biases and to check them. Um, and a lot of the students that I work with are also excited about advocacy journalism, which wasn't even really a category 20 years ago in the same way that it is now. Um, and so I think both of those are interesting developments. Um, but I think they work best when they are also paired with media literacy because, um, first of all, it is, it is clear that most people consuming news in the United States are not great at discerning the difference between um, trustworthy news reporting, opinion and commentary, and like true disinformation. Um, and so to help people understand like, you know, and, and, and the, it goes beyond just reporting, it's also understanding like the provenance of a photo that you see on the internet or, um, you know, I mean, there's, there are so many ways to manipulate one another. And if you think of it as sort of a spectrum of misinformation, which is like, just like the erroneous headline that um, a wacky distant relative sends you and unknowingly is sharing misinformation all the way to like disinformation that is created with the intent to lie to people, maybe with a political motivation, right? So, if, and probably all of us have at some point fallen victim to the misinformation side at least, though I doubt that we're home like doctoring videos um, to like shift, you know, to, to influence campaigns. but. Um, with a stronger media literacy project in the United States, everyone we will be better at understanding what they're they're consuming. You can consume good journalism that still has an advocacy angle. You can consume journalism that really seeks to be objective. Things like newspapers that serve their local communities, um, and then the ability to just like reject the things that just don't check out, right? Uh, New Jersey, I think, just became the first state to maybe make media literacy a part of their official public school curriculum. Um, it looks, I think that, I think it passed today, maybe. Anyway, there was, um, I was reading some coverage the other day about it, and I think that today was the day that it was going to happen. So um, that's really promising. And I think, so in some ways, the technology moved faster than we, than most news consumers, I don't even really like the word consumers, but right, like the way we actually receive this information, we, none of us had like the, the armor to handle it yet. So I think there's a way to do that. And then the angry letter thing, which can be really constructive and good as letters to the editor, editor can really demonstrate, um, but it can also be a form of like vilifying journalism and sending threats and increasing toxic polarization. I think that that's just part of like such a broader cultural ailment that I'm not sure the answer lies with journalism. I think mm -hmm. that's like a that's like a bigger question for democracy. <laughs> we won't be able to solve tonight. Yeah. Well, can I follow that into a, a segue to something I've had on my mind mm -hmm. for quite a while? Um, you know, back in the day when I was a journalist, 
day, and I, I agree with you that we just haven't come along as fast as digital media, and we haven't been prepared, but back in the day, we had the Fairness Doctrine. And back in the day, we had a Federal Communications Commission that regulated corporate broadcast media. And it seems to me that only a few rare people have been willing to even discuss the fact that uh, our current administration has been unable to succeed getting their nominee to the FCC, so we have a whole FCC. And there's been no discussion of the internet as part of communications infrastructure that should be regulated at a federal level with some kind of a broader fairness doctrine that addresses the issues of censorship, misinformation, disinformation, uh, corporate propaganda. Um, there are a couple of other things that I've had on my mind. And I'm curious about how you think about those things, because very few people do I see talking about them. And I don't believe that in a democracy, corporations should be regulating themselves. So. Yeah. Where do we go with that? I, I think the discussion's happening. I mean, we're talking about it now, so that's one thing. But, I mean, even I read an um, editorial in the Washington Post yesterday about, um, about the uh, nominees, for example, um, not being able to make it through. Uh, so I, th I think it is happening. I think that there's just so much noise with other crap in it that we, it's really easy for most people to blow by the substantive discussion. There's a great series um, that On the Media is doing right now at WNYC about how right-wing um, media, uh, uh, radio, excuse me, has sort of exploited the loopholes of FCC regulation and the Fairness Doctrine. And the Fairness Doctrine comes with its own complications, too, because um, there, it, it almost feels like such an enormous conversation. I don't even really know like how to get at it in this room, but um, clearly, these platforms that we do not regulate as um, uh, utilities or public programs are have play a more central role than anyone had anticipated. Maybe somebody had anticipated, but we weren't prepared for it, and now we're in the situation. There's no. Uh, it absolutely has to be dealt with. I totally agree with you, and I and you know we're talking mostly about. I mean. The kinds of I think the kinds of broadcast programming you're talking about, it doesn't like fit neatly into newsroom reporting, but I think that it is influencing the entire environment in which like we're all consuming news and the ways that we think about journalism and the ways, um, and and then the ways that we self sort and. Uh, confirmation bias is like just kind of drawing us closer and closer to the things that we already believe to be true. Um, Can I pose a question to you real quick? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I'm like scared to even touch that one because it's so <laughs> enormous, but it's really important, yeah. Um, you might know some figures on this. I mean, what is, what are the trends in news consumption, allegedly? I mean, what do people report that they... So um, I just saw last week that most people uh, get most of the headlines they see come from Facebook mm. and um, which is like pretty problematic even if um, if you have no problem with Facebook at all it's still tricky because it is also still um, well I mean this it is my opinion that there that Facebook is kind of stealing content from news organizations that are paying for reporters to go out and do like hard boots on the ground work. And so that's another aspect of the regulation that needs to be dealt with because um, it, uh, it, they're finding ways around the, the, like, the sustainability of news, of good so, journalism. So the, I've been reading about that this whole past week. I don't remember the four letters for the act that's getting pushed through Congress right now and there's a huge movement of most of the like the Electronic Frontier Foundation mm -hmm. and I want to say two dozen organizations, the ACLU, mm -hmm. who are saying, nope, this is a really awful bill. And it seems like so on Facebook with my group of 
people, some of whom are in the academic world in media studies and others are yeah, critical thinking and others are just people, are saying, well, what is this about? And, and I'm trying to ugh, I'm lose the thought. Of the thought. Um, one of the points of view is exactly opposite to yours, and I actually happen to share it in that um, Facebook, because I self-select my resources, is um, amplifying those particular news outlets. So, for example, I wouldn't go to the UK Guardian half as much if I didn't have a particular person following a story like, uh, what's her name, Todd Walliter, who uh, broke the uh, Cambridge Analytica story that was totally blamed on Facebook, but actually it wasn't. It was the employees of Cambridge Analytica, and unless you really dove down into the facts behind her story, you wouldn't know that Eric Prince and a major Chinese financial firm were behind Cambridge Analytica. And as soon as it gets too hot, they dissolve as a corporation and they change their name. So I'm like winding around a lot of the issues you were talking about to say that I don't, I don't think we're really, unless we're really looking and asking a lot of questions, we're not getting a fair narrative even about what Facebook is about, or mm -hmm. most of us don't really understand what the Cambridge Analytica story was about. Because whether it's in um, broadcast, you know, traditional broadcast TV, cable, or whether it's in uh, investigative news reports or daily news, we just get like little right. snippets off the top. And you have to be a very committed almost um, researcher that has bad undertones now in social media, but to, to really keep asking questions and digging deeper when you really don't know what the story is about. Um, so just to say, um, going back, I really feel like, I never use Twitter, but I think people who do did a similar thing, are sharing the uh, more corporate news stories that don't have a paywall and use it uh, to amplify and to do what um, the fourth estate was protected to do, which is to give people more information freely so that we can be informed. And you can't do that if there's a paywall, and you can't do that if you have to subscribe. Most of us can't do that. Good journalism costs money to make. That's the only, I mean, that's the defense of it, is that like if you want war reporting, you have to be able to buy war reporters uh, armor, you know? And so um, maybe it's, maybe we find collective ways to fund it, and that's the answer. But there has to be an answer, because if you're not paying, then you're the product, and that's the problem with social media. And I wonder if the demand is there to support the funding needed because we know that sensationalism sells, right? So you could have the best story in the world and covering all of a sudden and people are like, nah, not interested. Well, look at that shiny thing over there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's gonna you know sell your newspaper, sell your article, get you subscription. You know, yeah. Unfortunately, the economics at the end of the day. Yeah, and war reporting is a good example. But even on you know more simple level, it's you know I I want to have reporters want to be able to pay their rent and you know right. eat food. It's not yes. even as exotic as you know yeah. need to yeah. you know. You gotta yeah. We don't even have to like fund satellite trucks to do live broadcasts anywhere. So, you know we have reporters' notebooks and and uh, you know our phones to record interviews with. So it's not like those expenses aren't huge. It's just that the particularly community news organizations serve such small numbers of people um, that most of the funding models that we see brought up don't account for that. I mean, there's a big push for, or there has been a big push for um, larger entities to you know, request um, funding from their readers, and that works great if you have 
you know, a million and a half readers. If you have a couple thousand readers, then, ooh. One of the things about the Fairness Doctrine was its equal time clause. Yep. And people stopped saying bullshit because they didn't want to use their airtime giving equal time to other people. And that eliminated a lot of opportunity for that back and forth that is constructive, that butts heads but does come to some resolve when, when it's a requirement. I think, so, so I'm, I think Reagan really wrecked a bunch of stuff when he did away with the fairness yeah. doctrine. And, but it served his purposes really well. Even um, then, I mean, the fairness doctrine wouldn't cover most of the entities that we're talking about. Yeah, even even right. newspapers. Yeah. Right. Newspapers are as old as it gets in you know, American reporting anyway, and the fairness doctrine didn't apply to newspapers. But I, I think it's also important to raise like algorithmic news feed. Yeah. Like that is the scariest thing going on right now and has created all this factionalization. Algorithmic show you what you want because you clicked on it. And, yeah. and that amplifies ugly to ugly and good to good and maybe they never see good or ugly anywhere else. It's very strange and, and siloed and quite disturbing. And one of the the really like tangible outcomes of that, which is, um, it's like it's like a passive kind of um, confirmation bias. I don't think most people on social media even recognize that the news that they think they're seeing freely is actually being like, uh, it, it's being delivered to them to, and it's drawing them down a path in the same direction, um, is that there are fewer and fewer with more political polarization we see less and less split ticket voting in small places. And um, <clears throat> split ticket vote, regardless of like what your politics are, it does appear that at least at the state level, things work pretty well when people are willing to defy the party they usually identify with for a smarter person or somebody who represents their ideas or just more experienced or whatever. And then you get a little bit of a mix. Vermont has always been kind of an example of that. It swings a little bit, but it's been pretty good at split ticket voting for a There's long a story time. Last week about Vermonters splitting tickets yeah. more than other states. And it's becoming rarer and rarer. And that's like, and it leads to gridlock, right? And, and to be fair, that is, in Vermont at least, a relatively recent, like, within our lifetime, not That's well, true, not yeah. within our lifetimes, but just before our lifetime phenomenon, there's this great old guy in East Randolph named Marshall Armstrong who calls me and will talk to me for an hour and a half at a time every Friday or so. And he has an encyclopedic knowledge of every politician that ever did anything in Vermont. And he can name, and he'll you know recite them all and they're all Republicans until 1960 something. And then, and then we start to see that, uh, yeah. that interesting mix. It's true. It's all kind of new. America's kind of new. America's kind of new. <laughs> we really haven't ironed it out yet, <laughs> figured it out. Yeah. Okay, time for one more question. Yeah. I'm going to do a little disclosure and say that Vermont Humanities actually supports the Community News Project uh, with grant funding uh, uh, to specifically to support humanities, arts, and culture um, reporting. Uh, but I, my question is really, you know, when you are working with 20-something new reporters, what's <coughs> exciting them about being in this field? You know, it's, it's a hard field to go into. The pay is not very good. The hours are really long. Uh, it's a, it can be a slog. You know, I, I worked at Digger for a little while. I, I, I saw what, what it was like uh, for many of the young reporters. But what, what is it about it? now that's, that's getting people revved up to, to want to be journalists? That's a great question. Um, I think it's different for a lot of people. I know I see a lot of, this isn't necessarily community news service people, but we also have a ton of, um, or we have had a ton of high school interns, which is how I got started at the, at the Herald. And there's a certain set that is really passionate about some type of activism um, that gets them interested in, in community involvement, and that's, that's a, 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 an entry for some people. Um, there are, some people are just like incredible government nerds, and they just love going to, to um, 
know, uh, select board meetings or reading through court documents. And like they're purpose driven. You know? Yeah, and they, they, they thrive on that minutia. And when we find those, we just like, oh wow, these are our people. That's fantastic. We're glad, so, we're glad that you made it here. One of their characteristics is just insatiable curiosity. Yeah. Ju young journalists I work with just have question after question after question. They're all great, just really role modeling this inquiry and, and then reporting on it and then role modeling that inquiry out into the community is really quite constructive, positive activity. Yeah. One really exciting avenue, too, is the explosion of um, data journalism that st students at UVM really, when, they, when you explain to them like what you can get with a FOIA request, and then you're like, all right, it's going to take you a month to read through the most boring documents ever, but you might like find the smoking gun in them. Mm -hmm. um, that's like that's a pretty cool realization, and um, and then I mean that's like Bob Woodward like big sexy stuff, but not in the day to day work. It's not, um, and there's a local version of it too because like that's the court documents too. Um, so I think and it, and I think it also like works with a lot of you know they're all digital natives, um, and so I think they feel really comfortable trying to like track down the original sources. Uh, they also. When I, you know, you probably had this experience too, where you're just like, no, you're gonna have to call people on the telephone. See, I was just gonna say, <laughs> nice, the, the other nice thing is that at the advantage is you don't have to talk to a yeah. person. You get, the, you get the document sent to you, and you just read through them and, and think that you can write your story. But no, you have to, you have to go. You can't get around the phone. Yeah, you yeah. gotta go talk they don't to a person. That. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, everyone in the community, for having this conversation. Thank you very much.